Welcome to another video about VEX functions. This time we talk about make transform. This is an interesting one because on the first glance it looks really complicated. Just take a look at all those different function definitions. But then once you understand what it's for and what you can do with it, it becomes fairly simple. And then you realize it's real potential. And we are back in crazy town. So let me try my best explaining to you what this function is really for. But let's start with the very basic approach. According to the description of the function, it builds a 3x3 or 4x4 transform matrix. Matrices are worth their own tutorial series. But this is the gist of it. A 3x3 matrix is basically an array of three vectors. One vector holds three components and three vectors in a row build a 3x3 matrix. In a 4x4 matrix, just imagine each of those vectors now has four components and we also add one additional vector to the array. But how can we apply that in a wrangle? Let's create a very basic implementation that still allows us to control the outcome. As you can see, this function needs a lot of parameters. And I'm going to create those parameters according to the SiteFX documentation. First, I create this T vector, which is meant to control the translation of the geometry. By setting this to the result of the function CHV, I basically feed that vector with a new IO element that I'm creating in the following step. And I'm doing the same for all the parameters I'm going to need. I'm aiming to use this function definition. I already have T for translate and then I'm going to need R for rotate, S for scale, P for pivot and PR for pivot rotation. Once I have defined all of those channels, I can click this icon and all the necessary UI elements get created. As you can see, all of those are vectors. Vectors that have three components. And if you look at this, it almost looks as the matrix this will become. As you can see in the definition, only this variation will create a 3x3 matrix. All of the other versions will create the 4x4 transform matrix. So let's start with that. To save the result of the function, we need a matrix. Let's call it what it is. It's a transform matrix. Those function calls start with two integer parameters. Now here the documentation is a bit thin. The parameters are called TRS and XYZ. On the first glance, this could mean anything, but their only purpose is to define the order in which the following operations are processed. The parameter TRS defines the order for translate, rotate and scale, while the parameter XYZ controls in which order we rotate around the three axes. In this very basic example, the order of the transformation is not really important. So I'm simply going to use the index zero. That means TRS is using scale, rotate, translate and XYZ is sorting the rotate order according to its name. The other parameters are already defined, so I can simply fill those in with T, R, S, P and P, R. And if you're curious what is saved in that matrix, you can use the command printf, provide the matrix and you can see the content of the matrix in the console. Now one of the bigger questions is how can I utilize that matrix? And this is the point where it becomes really simple. To use the matrix to transform a given vector, all you have to do is to multiply that position with your matrix. After doing that, the UI elements which represent the parameters of the function allow you to have full control over your geometry, just as if you would use a simple transform swap. Now to the one function definition that creates a matrix 3. For this implementation, you only need to provide two vectors. It's described as the z-axis and the y-axis. And this is where we enter a section of vector math where we can either dig deep into this to fully understand what's going on or just take the basic information and learn how you can work with it. That's the beauty of Houdini. It will do the heavy lifting for you. So in the docs you will find if you provide make transform with a normalized z and y vector like so, you will create an identity matrix. Again, another topic on its own. But to make a really general statement about what that means, if you would multiply any matrix with an identity matrix, the initial one doesn't change at all. But how can we utilize such a matrix? 
To show you that, I once again have to make an excourse to other functions that we will cover in detail another time. But again, I think it's important to see the connections, how these different functions work together. So I take my identity matrix and use it as a parameter for the rotate function. I'm also going to add a float variable through a radiance function and provide a normalized y-axis. And to put that all into place, I multiply my position with the identity matrix. At the moment, amount is zero. And that's why this matrix doesn't change the position at all. But as soon as I change that value, the whole matrix creates a rotation for my geometry. If I type in $f for the current frame, the picket will rotate in a time-based animation. And that would be exactly the same as using our initial transform matrix and changing the provided rotate vector. But now we could also change the provided pivot vector, which manipulates the point the geometry rotates around. So by setting this to 2, the picket now runs in circles. So that's basically what this function does. It allows you to transform your geometry. But the important question now would be, when does it make sense to use this VEX approach to transformation over a simple transform SOP? You could do all of that in a matter of seconds with a transform. So why bother with this function? If you only need to transform a static geometry, there's not really a benefit by using it. But as soon as your geometry source gets dynamic, then this becomes a valid approach. To demonstrate that, I create a polygon circle with quite a lot of divisions, then create a remesh with a fixed target edge length of 0 0.05 and make it two iterations. This gives us a lot of points to work with. But for this example, I need the points to be sorted by the proximity to the center. Simple enough by using a sort node. So the small point numbers are around the center and the bigger point numbers are at the edge of the circle. Keep that in mind when we now use the make transform function. For that, I just copy over what we have already established, get rid of our initial implementation of it, but we still want to use the vector variables that feed the make transform function. As I said, the baseline of this example is that the source geometry changes over time. One way to do that could be to put all your points into one array. And that's what I do here. I create a loop over all of the points and each point gets put into the array PTS. During this example, I will need two more variables, the transform matrix and a position vector. And I want to apply my geometry manipulation in two different steps. And I will put that manipulation in a nested loop, which means I have an outer loop that I can control with an external channel called turns, and then an inner loop that iterates over the PTS array. But the key factor here, this loop iterates for the length of that array. So if there are 100 elements in the array, this loop takes 100 iterations. If we only have 50 elements left, the loop will only iterate 50 times. Inside of the inner loop, I'm going to get the position of the current point. And while I'm in here, I'm taking the translation and rotation vectors and add their value on top of themselves. Now I can fill the transform matrix with the function. I provide all the available vectors and multiply the position variable with the transform matrix. Since I'm dealing with a normal variable and not the attribute at p, I have to use setPointAttrib to set the current point position to that variable. But now that I think of it, having the input parameters like t for translate to be the factor that I start with and the factor that I add on top of it, I might get results that are too extreme. Oftentimes when dealing with loops, especially nested loops, it's quite difficult to observe the development of the variable. So as a best practice, it's a good idea to use an initialized variable. So let's create a translate and rotate equals zero and use that as basis, which get provided for the make transform function. But now let's take a look how all of this falls into place. Let's say I increase the parameter t, which influences the translation. More specifically, I'm increasing the y-axis by just a tiny bit. Since this tiny value gets increased by itself with each iteration for each point in our geometry, the first points only move a tiny bit. But the farther away we go from the center, that value increases. The same goes for the rotation. The lower points barely move while the top points create a look of very heavy distortion. And this is one reason to use a VEX based transform. Changing the incoming parameters over time will change the result on your geometry by a lot. 
The other reason to use a VEX based transform would be if you change the amount of points that get manipulated over time. I have not yet used my outer loop. It still only uses one turn. If I use multiple turns in this setup, I will just increase the overall value of the translation vector. So in my example, my bowl will make a uniform jump on the y-axis throughout all of the available points. So this will become much more interesting if I manipulate the amount of points that is saved in the array PTS that I set up in the beginning. And one of the easiest ways to do that would be to use a pop on the array. This will delete the last element of the array. So what will happen if I now execute this code? Just pause the video for a second and think about it. As you can see, we still have the same translation for most of the points, but since we drop one element of the array with each iteration before we reach all of the points, at some point the exit condition for the loop, which is the length of the array, stops before we have reached all of our points. And that's why at some point the outer points stay at the ground. Now the interesting part is, if we now increase the turns of the outer loop, we get the jump in the y-axis, but only for a fraction of the points. Because for each additional iteration, the array loses additional points. And now you might get an idea when it makes sense to use VEX based transformation. It's when you need to make dynamic changes to your geometry. For example, if I now invert the point order, I get a totally different result. And if you continue to play with this setup, you will see that you can create quite a wide variety of different shapes. And remember, all of this is done in one single wrangle node. Of course, there are always multiple ways to get to the same result. You could also do this by creating the loop with SOPs and use a transform SOP to affect the available points. But as you know, I just love to work with the VEX language and see what it's capable of. I hope this video gave you a good idea what you can do with the make transform function and how to make use of it in your projects. I hope you found this useful and I see you next time.